Uh, We started a new series last week entitled, It Is Written. We're talking about what we believe about the Bible, God's word. And so as we started that off last week, I talked about that the Bible, all 66 books, let me be clear because my wife waited till I got down last week and she said, how many books are in the Bible? I said, 66. She said, well, you said 69. And so in between the services, the first service and second service, I added a couple of books to the Bible, don't worry. We've got them taken back out. We're all set. And we have 66 books of our Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. I mean, aren't you thankful for your spouse to correct you? Come on. Someone else said their grandson also corrected me. They said, Papa, that's not right. And so we give God praise for our kids knowing their scripture. Uh, I do know my scripture. I just got a few numbers mixed in my head whenever I was trying to add 66 and 397 and 90 all together. My nines got out of order, okay? But they're all back in order. All the books are back in the Bible. There's 66 and we're ready to move forward. And what we talked about last week in that was that the Bible is what we build our faith. It's our foundation that we build our beliefs on, not that we walk in and prop our ideas up against. We don't go and find scripture to support what we believe. We find what we believe from the scriptures. Can I get an amen? And so we talked about last week that God gave us this word. He, the scripture says that it is God inspired, God breathed, and written by men. And so we supported that. And last week, we also recognized that the the authority and the accuracy of the scripture is verified by its author, who is God. And how many of you know he's been faithful throughout the ages? And history has proven many of the things that we find in scripture. And so we hold that by faith and believe in God's word as the full word of God. Well, today we're going to step in a little bit farther and we're going to talk about the purpose of God's word. Now, how many of you out there, do I have my web MD families? Any, anybody web MD, you're like, you're walking through some things, you got a headache, you know, this bump. And so like anybody else just look up things on web MD just to make sure you're still okay. And not, uh, yeah. And so one of the things like you're having these symptoms and so you can put your symptoms in WebMD. Now you guys act like you have never gone on WebMD. I know some of you are hypochondriacs and you guys have looked over your issues many times over. So WebMD, you can put your symptoms in and it'll it'll tell you some ideas of what might be wrong, or you can put in your condition, and it'll give you some answers for it. But I love WebMD because like, you can walk through some things in life and be feeling some things. You put it in there. It gives you the information, but it always says this, consult a physician. What it says is like, hey, listen, there's a higher source in this. How many of you know that sometimes in scripture, we go to scripture and we kind of try and treat it like WebMD. We don't want to read the whole thing. We don't want to go see the doctor. We just want to see kind of an idea of what might be happening, get some encouragement in that way. And it always says there, you got to go back to Jesus. How many of you know that Jesus is the answer? If you don't, you're going to learn. Jesus is the answer. It's kind of like the children's pastor. He was teaching his kids that... Jesus is the answer to every question. Regardless of the question, Jesus is the answer. And he was faithful to teach this to his children. And so one Sunday morning, he was using a squirrel as an illustration. And he says, all right, kids, now I'm gonna describe someone, something, and whenever I describe it, I want you to tell me what you think it is. So it's gonna be, who am I? And the kids are like, okay, okay. They knew the answer already, right? And so he begins to describe and he says, all right, so I live in trees and I eat acorns. Nobody raised their hand. He said, hmm, I thought that would be an easy one. He said, okay, so um, I can climb really fast. I live in trees. I have a bushy tail and I eat acorns. Still no response. Wow. So he says, "Um, okay, Um, I have a bushy tail, I have a long tail, I live in trees, I can climb really fast, I eat acorns, and I run from limb to limb in the tree. Who am I? Nobody responded. So now he's a little bit flustered and he's like, man, how do I get this? He said, okay, okay, here it is. I, I have a long tail, I live in trees, I can climb really fast, I eat acorns, I have big teeth, and I like to run across the road in front of cars. Who am I? One little kid raised his hand. He's like, kind of halfway, you know, it's like, I think I know the answer. He said, Yes, Johnny, what do you, what, who am I? And he says, Well, you're Jesus, but you sound an awful lot like a squirrel. (laughs) 
The point being that we always come back to Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Here's our sermon and a sentence for today. And it's this, the purpose of the Bible. The Bible points me to Jesus so I may know him and become more like him. And I wanna highlight this phrase, me. The Bible is not for to just to point you to Jesus. The Bible is written so that God himself can direct me to his son, Jesus, so that I may know him and become more like him. When James writes in James chapter one, he tells us that the Bible itself is like a mirror. When we read scripture, here's a couple of things that we recognize. We recognize first and foremost, the sovereignty of God. We see his beauty, his splendor, his holiness, his, gl- his glory in so many different ways. And what we also see whenever we read the scriptures is we see humanity's brokenness, our selfishness, our arrogance, our pride. We see so many things about ourselves in the scripture. And so James says, when we open God's word, it's like we're looking in a mirror and it's showing us ourselves. And so what he says there is with that moment, whenever we're seeing God's glory, we're seeing our brokenness, there's this deep divide. There's this gap, if you will. And what the scripture is constantly speaking to is that Jesus is the one who bridges that gap. Whenever we see the the glory of God and his holiness, his beauty, his splendor, our brokenness, our sinfulness, and we can say, no, we can, there's no way that we can get to where he is. Jesus steps in and bridges that gap for us and allows us to walk in relationship with God. So Paul is writing in 2 Timothy chapter three, and if you have your Bibles, you can turn there as we're gonna spend some time there. Paul is writing to Timothy. Paul is in prison. Timothy is in a, a, a difficult place in life. The culture is changing around about him. There's lots of pressures going on. And he begins to write in the first part of this chapter about the way that people are moving away from God. He says, in these last days, people will be arrogant. They will be prideful. They will be lovers of self. They will be disobedient. They will be disobedient to their parents. They're gonna be all about themselves and they're moving away from God. And Paul's like, I'm concerned that you, Timothy, are gonna be pressured by the culture around about you. And so I wanna remind you that God's word is true, that the scriptures are the place that we come home to. And so he writes these few verses, beginning in verse 12, and he says this, "'Indeed, all who want to live in a godly way "'in Christ Jesus will be persecuted.'" Verse 13, "'But evil people and imposters "'will proceed from bad to worse, "'deceiving and being deceived. "'You, however, continue in the things "'that you have learned and become convinced of, "'knowing from whom you have learned them.'" And that from your childhood, you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And all scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped of every good work. I believe that in the middle of this passage, in verse 15, 15 specifically, that Paul summarizes the point of the scriptures, and that is that they point us to Jesus so that we may know him. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Father, we love you today. We thank you for the beauty and the power of your word. We thank you for your grace and your mercy that comes to us through Jesus Christ. We ask, Father, that you would open up our hearts to see, to understand, to grow in knowledge and in wisdom and experience through the grace of your word And we ask, Lord Jesus, again, that you would open up our eyes, that we would see the wonderful truths of your word. I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations in my heart would be pleasing and acceptable in your light and in your strength, O Lord, my Redeemer. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I was reminded this week as I was reading of a story of an American professor who was invited to be a professor in Oxford, England. And so he and his wife arrived a few days before they were to start their assignment. And they were touring the city to get an idea of this beautiful historic city that they were going to be living and working in. And so as they're visiting the city, they're walking around and they're seeing these old ancient uh, buildings, they're stone and almost seemingly crumbling, but over time, you know, and so they're looking at these buildings and saying, man, what great history. Look at the, the, the time, the relics of, of history that are here before us. And as the lady was standing there staring at this building to which she was thinking was uh, condemned, she says to her husband, oh, honey, 
these ruins are inhabited because she had seen a light pop on in the distance. And so she, what she thought was a ruin was actually a house that someone was living in. It reminded me that sometimes people approach the scriptures that way. They think that these are old history stories that is a matter of just, just looking back with great fondness on what used to be. But what we, you and I have to understand is that the scriptures are living and they're inhabited with the spirit of God. And so whenever you and I begin to open them up, they're not just telling us about what God has done in the past, but they become alive to those who have faith in Jesus Christ and the spirit of God begins to bring them and the truth to life within us, amen? And so it's not just ruins and ancient ruins that we visit to look upon. There is the living word of God that we open up and our eyes are opened up to see. Here's the first point I wanna share with you this morning and that is this. The Bible gives us the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Jesus. This is, again, probably the most summarized version of the Bible, of the purpose of the Bible. Let's go look at this, and we're going to break this down in a few ways. Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says, from your childhood, you have learned about these sacred writings which lead to Jesus. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, Early on in your life, your mother Eunice, your grandmother Lois have begun pouring to you the scriptures. Scholars say that most likely that, P, that T Timothy was actually taught his alphabet as well as how to read by looking at the Old Testament and processing and learning from the Old Testament itself. This idea of sacred writings here is literally speaking of the Old Testament, the law and the prophets that were brought forward in faith. Now, at this particular time, there may have been some letters, some information from the New Testament, but primarily Paul is saying these sacred writings are the Old Testament. But it's interesting there because if you follow this, it says that they're leading us to Jesus. You know, I've heard people say this before, that we don't need the Old Testament because we have the New Testament now. Now that we have Jesus, the Old Testament is, is no longer relevant. We don't look to it. But what Jesus tells us is that all Scripture points us to himself. In fact, in Luke chapter 24, you remember that after Jesus has been resurrected, that there are some disciples who are, they're just downtrodden, they're broken because they realize that Jesus is now missing. And he walks along with them on this road to Emmaus. And the Bible says this in Luke chapter 24, verse 27. And it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets. Moses would have been Genesis, from Genesis, all the way through the prophets, all of the prophets, he says. He explained to them everything that was written about himself in all the scriptures. What Jesus says is this, it's not just the New Testament that talks about me. God has been trying to point humanity to me throughout all of the scriptures. In that book of Acts, in the eighth chapter, whenever the Ethiopian eunuch is traveling along, along and he's reading the, the, the prophet of Isaiah and he comes to this place where he can't understand. And so the Bible says that the spirit of God directs Philip to step in and begin to meet with him and to explain the scriptures. But watch what it says. It again says that beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to them. Here's the point of the Bible. The Bible from beginning to end is constantly pointing you and me to the beauty of who Jesus Christ is. That's its purpose. It's wonderful whenever we go and find encouragement for the things that we're walking through. It's wonderful whenever we find that moment of peace or it's wonderful whenever we're opening up and we're figure, trying to figure out, do we find this job or that job? And we glean some level of truth from the scriptures, but that's just a part of what it is the scripture is constantly pointing us to Jesus. If we go back to verse 15, the next word I wanna focus on is this word salvation. It's not just telling us about who Jesus is. It doesn't wanna just lead us to the historical figure and to recognize that Jesus really did live on this earth and he walked around and did great things. It's leading to us to this point that salvation comes through Jesus Christ's name. This word salvation literally means deliverance. Jesus didn't come to be our friend. He didn't come to be our homie. He didn't come to be our wisdom piece. He came to save us from our sins, right? In fact, if you wanna know the beauty of scripture, the beauty of scripture is trying to tell us how beautiful God is, how broken we are, and that Jesus is the source and the answer for our issues. 
I love the, the seventh chapter of the book of Romans. Paul is writing there, and if you're in our reading program, we're in it this week. Paul's writing there and he begins to talk about this moment. He says, you know, I, I've gone through life and, and I didn't know what even it was to covet, but then I read the scriptures and the scriptures began to talk about that I shouldn't covet. And he says that in that moment that sin took this idea of what I wasn't supposed to do and it brought it to life to where I, now all I want to do is to covet. And he, and he says there in this moment, it was the scriptures that have revealed to me the things that are broken about me. And, and the... Part of this passage comes down to the 24th verse when Paul writes this and he comes to this conclusion. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free? The beauty of God's word is it shows us that we need a savior. It shows us that you and I, we as good as Paul was, as religious as Paul was, as much as he knew the scriptures, it led him to a place that said, I can't keep doing this because I don't have it within me to do good. So he says, and he asks this question, who's going to set me free from this sin that's within me? I love verse 25. It says this, thanks be to God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul says this, it is Jesus who brings salvation to set me free and it frees me from the sin that's holding me back. And it's all within me. If we go back to verse 15, he goes on even further and he says this, it's not just that we have salvation, but it's salvation through faith. Now this again was important because so many people knew the scriptures. They knew the law. The religious people of Jesus' day, of Paul's day, they had memorized scripture. But Paul didn't say it's through your knowledge of the scripture that brings you, faith, uh, brings you salvation. He says, it's through faith in Jesus. I, you go into uh, 2 Corinthians where Paul is writing and we'll, in verse 14, he says there, he says, still to this day, whenever the people of Israel, they read the scriptures. He says, oftentimes they read the scriptures with their eyes being blinded with this veil over their eyes and they cannot see Jesus. They cannot see Jesus as being the answer to their problem. And he says in verse 14 and 15, he says, but to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Here's what, something I wanted to share with you this morning. There are many people who read the scriptures. They can even study the scriptures. There are professors in universities, in theological universities across the country who can tell you the historical facts, they can tell you the, the grammatical things that are there to lead to the truth, and yet they still do not have the faith to believe that Jesus is the one who sets them free. They have a knowledge, but they do not have faith. Paul says specifically, the Bible's pointing us to Jesus, is showing us our brokenness, our need for a deliverer, but we, by faith, must turn to it. I love what this last part is in verse 15. Again, he says this, it leads us to wisdom, the wisdom that is in Christ Jesus. You know, we as humanity are all about wisdom. We're all about advancing and growing in knowledge. I thought of it this week, and this is just one example. You can think of many. How many things have changed in my life with technology, just in my lifetime? I just, I'm gonna take the, the realm of music and how we listen to music, okay? Whenever I was a little, little bitty kid, I remember that my dad, my mom had an AM, FM radio. That's all we had. And then they came out with this thing called an eight track. And you could take eight songs and put them on this little cassette. And our car, we were, we were poor and broke. We couldn't do that. And so they had made like a version that you could install yourself. And so my dad wired one into my mom's car and we could, all of a sudden, we got to pick and choose the music that we wanted to listen to. Come on, it was life-changing. <laughs> then came along the cassette tape. Anybody remember the cassette tape? Like changed, changed lives. Oh yes, come on. Somebody just got saved over here from the cassette tape. 
Cassette tape, you know, then cars started putting the cassette players in the car, right? And so you could press the cassette tape and you could listen to music and it would flip it over to the backside. Remember whenever they created that where it automatically flip it over, you didn't have to flip the cassette itself? Some of you guys are way too old and young to remember that, <laughs> wherever you are. So then it went from the, CD, from the cassette player and then they came out with this thing called a CD. Anybody remember Sony Walkman? Uh, my daughter told me yesterday she wants a Sony Walkman. I'm like, man, that was like, I didn't even know they still made those things. But they created this CD that you could put this little round thing in this disc and all these songs could be on it. But listen, it didn't fit into your car. So you had to have that cassette tape adapter that had the wire coming out of the cassette tape to plug into your Sony Walkman so that you could listen to your CDs. I'm talking, my generation just stepped into the room. I heard you, I hear you. I see some dad explaining to his kid back there what, what, what we're talking about. So then they created technology and they got the music off of CDs and they got it into what they called MP3s. And there was like these digital files and then you could put these USB things and then Apple stepped into the field and they said, we're gonna change the game. We're bringing an iPod. You can put thousands of songs on this little thing. And then they said, hey, we got a better idea. We're gonna actually combine that with your phone so you don't have to carry two devices. Game changer. Then they came out with satellite radio. <laughs> Ain't nobody listening to satellite radio. They've called me four times this week trying to me to get me to subscribe. No, thank you. And so we come through this place and today, did you know that this today, that today they don't have CD players in cars? Now it's all satellite radio and or it's Apple CarPlay or Google Play, whatever that is. I don't live in the Google world, so you guys don't come throwing stones at me. I, whatever you call your Google version of, of CarPlay, all right? And so whenever they bring that, we don't even have CD players, but you know what we still have? The car with the greatest technology still has AM, FM radio. Something that's been around since 1930, almost 100 years old. And here's with all of the technology that's been created, we still go back to the steady. It reminded me of a, a quote that Pastor Doug used to say, the message doesn't change, though the method may. The method doesn't change, or the method changes, but the message never changes. Here's what Paul says to Timothy. Paul says to Timothy in verse seven of this passage, he says this, he said, listen, these people are constantly learning, but it never leads to, them to, to the knowledge of truth. They're constantly trying to get through this, but it never brings them to a place where they're able to accept the truth of who Jesus is. And so Paul says to Timothy, he gives them two, what I would call exhortations. He says, so I need you to lean into me for just a second, Timothy. There's something I want you to understand. The first one is this. He says that the wisdom of man will never exceed the truth of God's word. Listen to me. With all of the knowledge that we will gain, with all of the wisdom that we will amass and, and all of the technology that we have, this advancement that we have, we will never exceed the wisdom of the truth of God's word. He says in verse 13, he says this, he says, but pe evil people and imposters will proceed from bad to worse. This wording is so interesting because he says, actually they're advancing backwards. They think in their minds that they're moving ahead, that they're moving beyond their need for Jesus. But in reality, all they're doing is moving backwards because they're just continually being deceived as well as deceiving others. And he says to Timothy, Timothy, don't be moved by this advancement, this progression, if you will. But he says to him, the second exhortation is this. He says, keep believing what you have believed. Regardless of what they do, regardless of how far they move ahead, you have to keep believing in what you've believed in the first. He says here in verse 14, he says, you, you, however, I love this. This is a very emphatic contrast. It's like Paul is saying, Timothy, you, unlike them, you, regardless of what they do, you, however, must be different. He says, you don't worry about this progressing forward. You continue. This word literally means to remain, to abide. 
Meaning you don't have to grow any farther. You don't have to move anything. There's nothing else you need to learn other than Jesus Christ. You stay steadfast in what you have learned and what you have been convinced of. He says here, you learned about Jesus. Your grandmother and your mother have poured into you the faith. They've given you and passed down to you, but even more than that, it wasn't what other people told you, it's what you yourself became convinced of because you experienced the grace of Jesus Christ. Don't let other people convince you that Jesus is not the answer any longer. You come back and he says this, and whatever it is, even furthermore, don't forget who taught you these things. Who taught him? The people who loved him the most. And sometimes in life, we feel like we hear these voices. We go to universities and colleges. We go to schools where liberal people teach us and they're telling us and giving us all of their, the knowledge that they have. And they're trying to lead us away and sometimes we have to stop and pause and ask ourselves the questions, who loves me most? Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said this, he said, listen, you're gonna have many mentors, you're gonna have lots of teachers that try and speak into your life, but he says this, you will have very few fathers, very few who will love you enough to teach you and to hold you accountable to the truth. In all of our wisdom, in all of our gaining knowledge, in all of our understanding, Paul says this, you have to keep believing what you have believed. I wanna say this briefly. This world and this culture is constantly pressing against our faith. It's constantly pressing against the truth of who we hold Jesus to be. It's constantly saying to us that Jesus is so elementary. If we would just move forward in our wisdom, on the wisdom of this world that we would be farther advanced. But the scripture keeps pointing us back to Jesus. The scriptures give us the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. This week I read this quote and I wanna leave it as a, as a charge to us today. It comes from a commentary called the poor man's commentary. I love it. He says, reader, let us be waiting at wisdom's gates in these awful days of heresy. And let us behold and see how evil men and seducers among Pharisees and professors wax worse and worse, more wretched, more lean of soul, deceiving men like themselves, not God's people and being themselves deceived. And let the holy scriptures of our God, which are profitable for all things to the man of God, be daily in our hand while God the Spirit is instructing our heart that we may be found of him, that happy number made strong by grace in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Let us hold steady and keep believing what we have believed. Would you stand with me today? This week, as I was processing so many things, I was right, reminded of an experience that I had when I was in college. I had the privilege of going white water rafting. And if you've ever been white water rafting, you know, it's kind of fun, but there's also some, some scary moments on the water. And this was my second experience. My first experience was so new, but it was just kind of mild, but they send you in this long safety training. You know what I'm talking about? Where you have to go through all the things that could happen, but you're believing that they'll never happen to you and so you're not really paying attention, but you know they have to do it. Well, on this day, I had gone through the second round of training and I was like, oh, I've heard this before, nothing bad happened the last time, so I'm good. And so I just kind of tuned it out. And We get on the water and we're going on through some, some expert level rapids. And we get to one section on the river where there are a series of a couple of rapids together. And there's about a hundred yard uh, gap between them. 
And in between those two, in that 100 yard gap, there's one place just before you go into the third to the second uh, rapid, there's a, a ledge that you drop off that leads into a hole that leads into the next rapid. So what happens is, is whenever the boats make it successfully through the first round of rapids, what they do is they pull to the side and they stand on the shore and those who are in the boats can kind of get out and get some rest and, and stand up and stretch their legs. But all of the guides stand on the corner on the side of the bank on the shoreline with their throw lines ready to rescue those who fall out of the boat after the first rapid to capture them before they go into the second rapid because it's dangerous and could be life-threatening. Well, as life would happen, our boat flipped over after that first rapid. And so I was the person that never pictured myself being in the scenario that I was in. And if you've ever been in one of those moments, the boat generally flips over on top of you. You come up underneath it and you have life vests, you have helmets, but everything around about you, everything is moving so quickly, you're completely disoriented. And what seems like, it was only about three seconds, but what seems like three hours, your life is flashing before your eyes the entire time. And so I come up out of this and I don't know which way is down river, up river. I don't know where the banks are. Uh, you know, water, my eyes are about water level. And so it's just completely disorienting. And I can, all I can hear are the words of catch the rope, grab the rope, grab the rope. And I'm like, I don't even know where I am right now or where the rope is. And the very last rope, I was able to grab a hold of the end of it just before it went out of distance and I went across the ledge. It was a scary moment. But then they began to pull me in and as they began to pull me in, life began to slow down and I began to realize I was okay. You know, sometimes we feel like the scriptures are yelling at us and telling us how bad we are. Sometimes we seem like, it's like everybody's trying to tell us that we're wrong and, we're, and, th and things are bad and that how bad we are, but really all the scriptures are trying to tell us is, is that we're headed to danger. That there's this place of judgment that's just on the side of where we are. And if we don't change our ways and if we don't grab the lifeline of Jesus, that we will have to go through that judgment and it's not a good judgment. So what the scriptures is constantly saying to us is that, listen, it, it's screaming to us, like there are, there's danger ahead, but Jesus is the lifeline. He's the rope and he's already gone before us. And if you will just hold to him, he will bring you to safety. And whenever we come to the shoreline from safety and Jesus has brought us there, he actually takes us over the rapids so that we're not facing the rapids by ourselves. This is the point of scripture, is that Jesus desperately, desperately doesn't wanna see you or me or anyone on this earth go through the danger of judgment without him. And so Jesus has extended himself by grace and he's laid down his life to bridge that gap, to bring us to safety. And the point of the scripture today is, is that all we have to do is by faith, take a hold of his promise and believe that he is secure enough, that he is powerful enough and that he will bring us to safety. And so if you're here today and that's you, and maybe you're walking through a series of events in life and maybe life has been completely disorienting to you, but you feel the weight of this idea that you're facing life without Jesus. Maybe you feel like Paul, that the weight of your sins has just got you in the cycle that you can't break free from. He says to us and he gives us the answer, thanks be unto God who sets us free. So today I want to throw you a lifeline and his name is Jesus. And he desperately wants to bring you to a place of safety in him. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here today and you would say, Alan, that's me, 
I'm at a place where I need a savior. I recognize that my life is moving out of control. I'm heading into a place of danger and I need Jesus to forgive me of my sins and bring me to safety into a relationship with him. And today I'm ready to make that step, grab the promise through faith. If that's you, at the count of three, I wanna ask you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Amen. 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 Jesus, we come to you today with these hands that are lifted. God, I don't know the, I don't know the rapid that they're going through. I don't know the, the troubled waters that they're in today, but Lord, something in your word has spoken to them today that says, Jesus, I need to grab a hold of you. Jesus, I'm thankful that the scripture just says, Lord, in our confession, first and foremost, just acknowledging the fact that our sins, our choices, our decisions have us in a place of trouble, that we're facing danger. But Jesus, we're turning to you and asking you to save us, to save us from the wages of our sin. And God, bring us to safety. The scripture says, if we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, God, that we can experience this salvation that Paul speaks of. And so today, Lord, as these hands went up across this room, I ask in your grace and in your power that you would free them from themselves. God, I pray completely that you would wash over them and God, that the, great, that the shame and the, the things that are holding them back, Lord, that just the condemnation that sin has placed upon them, that that would be lifted, that the old things would pass away and behold, all things would be made new in you through faith. We love you. We thank you for that beautiful promise, Jesus. We welcome you now into our hearts in Christ's name, amen. Can we give them a hand this morning as they made that? Amen. Amen. Now I recognize a lot of hands didn't go up and so I wanna take this a step further this morning. One of the things I learned that day is whenever I grabbed that rope and they started moving me in the right direction and I got out of the immediate path of danger, the world kind of slowed down. I kind of recognized where the bank was. I recognized where I was and, and I wasn't feeling that imminent danger any longer. And so what happened was I decided that I was gonna let go of the rope because I could do it from here. And so I just held on with one hand and I began to swim with the other hand because I was just gonna help them out. I, I, I knew where I was then, but you know what happened? They started yelling at me again, grab the rope, grab the rope. Why? Because they had me. All I had to do was to hold the rope. I didn't, it wasn't about my power, my strength. They didn't need me to help. Can I tell you something this morning? God doesn't need you to help. And so one of the paths, one of the dangers that we have in life is that once we've grabbed a hold of the rope of Jesus and we get out of this pressure of feeling like we're in immediate danger and we begin to feel safe, we begin to let go of Jesus and we begin to try and do it on our own all over again. And Paul says, the thing of scripture is that it leads us to faith, that by faith we hold on to Jesus and we don't let go of Jesus. Regardless of how good you're doing, we still have to have Jesus. And so for some of us, that's our takeaway today is that you need to grab back a hold of Jesus with both hands. Because though it may feel safe now, this world is constantly leading us away from truth and we have to hold tightly to who Jesus is. Not by our wisdom, not by our works, not by anything that we can do. It's faith in Christ alone, amen. We're ready to step into this weekend and I know you have great things planned and I'm praying for safety and as you gather together as families and take your time this weekend, but as we do, let's just be reminded that we need Jesus. If you made a decision today and you asked Christ to come into your heart, or maybe you just made another confession where you said, man, I just need to 
double down on this and put Jesus back at the priority of my life. Take it to a moment to fill out the connect card and give us that information. We'd love to resource you and help you out. Maybe you've never been baptized and maybe you need to sign up and, and take the next step of baptism or be a part of our new believers class, get plugged into a life group. Whatever it is, take the next step that God has for you, amen? Let's close with this as we close today. Love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another, even so come Lord Jesus. God bless you guys. Have a safe weekend.